Isomers uh, is derived from, from two different words, iso and mers. So iso means same, and mers means parts. So isomers are looking at molecules or chemicals that are the same parts, but arranged differently somehow. And in an organic, we get into a good level of distinguishment between three different kinds, structural, configurational, and conformational. All of these are isomers in the sense that they are composed of the same pieces, but they are all configured some way differently. And, and there's variation amongst that. So for example, structural, these are actually connected differently. So here is C4H10, this is butane, and then this is C4H10, that's methylpropane. Those are two completely different chemicals, but they're both composed of four carbons and 10 hydrogens, so the same molar mass, uh, similar ideal gas law constructions, uh, and, and yet they're different chemicals. So different chemical and physical properties, these will react differently, even though they're both alkanes, there's some similarities, but there's a bulkiness to this that doesn't exist here. And melting points and boiling points will be different. And so structural, structural isomers are when you have the same parts, but arranged in a different order. Conformational isomers is kind of the far end of the spectrum. It's, it's when you literally have the same chemical, however, it's conformed differently. And so this kind of occurs in the difference between these two pictures. What we've done is we've rotated this bond so that the hydrogen goes from down to up. And that, that will be different then for those two molecules, uh, that, that these two have hydrogens uh, a little bit close together, and so there's some steric interactions there uh, that make this different than this. Okay. Now these are very similar, and so we really can't have a good discussion on physical and chemical properties because they're the same molecule. Uh, and we're looking at specific molecules rather than a bulk. Configurational, though, is the one where things get very tricky. So there are two kinds of configurational isomers. There are enantiomers, which are chemicals that are the same, but they're mirror images of each other that can't be put on top of each other. Uh, and so a good example of enantiomers are hands. So ignoring rings and freckles and things like that, your hands are mirror images of each other. If we had a mirror plane here, then, then they would reflect to see the exact same fingers on both sides. But I can't put my hand on top of one another and have them be the same. So they're different. And, and the only way for me to kind of detect that is with something else that's, that's like that. Uh, so if I have gloves, which are also enantiomers, then I can say, oh, I can't put a glove on my left hand uh, uh, because it's, it's, it's for my right-handed glove or whatever. Um, Chiral is going to be a word that's associated with enantiomers. Chiral uh, meaning the mirror image as well. Um, and, and enantiomers are something that have an interesting property. They're what's called optically active. The technical definition is complicated, but essentially they interact with light in a specific way. And specifically, polarized light that hits an enantiomer will, will rotate its plane of polarization uh, and, and then come out different than before. Okay. Uh, now, enantiomers is the one kind of configurational isomer. We're going to look at some specifics there in a second. Uh, the other kind are called diastereomers. And diastereomers really just means anything that's not an enantiomer that is a configurational or stereoisomer. And so there are two kind of branches of this as well. One is cis and trans, where E and Z kind of pairs. So you could look at alkenes for that, of course, things with double bonds. Uh, and you can also look at cyclic groups where the uh, constituents are above or below the plane of the, of the cyclic structure. Uh, and then the other kinds of diastereomers are similar to enantiomers in that in the, these kind of are derived with carbon with four different constituents. And sometimes there are, there are uh, molecules that will have two different carbons that are these stereocenters where they have four different things attached. And there are some of those molecules that will, will be very similar to enantiomers, but actually not mirror images. And those would be things. Uh, and we're going to go through this, but, but basically things that are RR versus RS uh, will not be enantiomers, but they would be diastereomers. So we'll go through what the R means in a little bit. So these are kind of our, our three kinds. We have structural, configurational, so some kind, sometimes called stereoisomers. Uh, and conformational can be included into that. Um, but I'm going to split it up into configurational, which is enantiomers and diastereomers, and then conformational as its own group. So we want to go through and look at what, what kind of things can we use to tell the difference between these, and in addition to that, what, what things should we know about their properties. 
So first of all, for enantiomers and diastereomers, uh, you want to know how to assign an R and an S configuration to them. So if I have a carbon with four different things attached, so let's look at but and 2 all. Okay. So this has four different things attached to figure out whether it's R or S. You need some way to kind of make this into a, a, a way to visualize this that everyone would be consistent. And so we label each of the different constituents a priority one through four. The smaller the atomic number, the larger the priority, the larger the number assigned to the priority. So the highest priority is going to be the oxygen here because that's the highest atomic number. Now these two are both atomic number six, but this one has another atomic six atomic number six attached. So this would get higher priority. It would go like that. And then what you need to do is you need to look at the carbon so that you look at it from an angle that the fourth priority is behind that carbon. So for me, I would kind of put my eye here and look at the molecule this way. And when you do that, you want to see if one, two, and three will go clockwise or counterclockwise. So in this case, I would go from one to two to three like this. That's a counterclockwise rotation. For counterclockwise, that's assigned an S. For clockwise, that would be assigned an R. Now, something that can be really helpful is that if you take two of these groups and you change their places, so if I flip-flop the hydrogen with the, with the ethyl, or if I flip-flop the ethyl with the hydroxyl group, that will automatically change R to S, or S to R. So if I were to redraw this with the ethyl group here, and the hydroxyl group here, Now I'm looking at four, one, two, three. Now I'm looking at a R configuration. So just by changing any two, you'll, you'll change your confirmation from R to S or S to R. Now, if you have an R configuration, then S is the enantiomer. Okay, so if you have a chiral stereo center that's assigned R, then the S configuration would be the enantiomer. If you have RR, then SS will be your enantiomer. However, if you have RR, where you have two of these stereocenters, and then you have another one that's RS, those will be diastereomers. Those will not be mirror images, and therefore they'll be uh, stereoisomers that are not mirror images, and therefore they'll be diastereomers. Okay, so given that, structural isomers have different physical and chemical properties. They're actually different chemicals, those are for boiling points, melting points, reactivities, and everything about them will be different. Conformational isomers, this really does not apply, because usually conformational isomers, we're looking at two specific molecules, and usually when we're talking about chemical and physical properties, we're looking at the bulk of a large amount of chemical. Uh, but enantiomers and diastereomers. So enantiomers are the same chemically, and they're the same physically with two exceptions. The way they interact with polarized light is a different chemical property, or different physical property. So the fact that one will rotate the plane of polarized light in one direction and the other will rotate in the other direction distinguishes the two, so we can tell them apart. And then their reactivities are identical as long as they are doing reactions with things that are not chiral, but they will react differently other chiral things. And this is important because there are situations that will come up where you will have an R and S mixture and you might want to separate it to only have one of those two. And that's a very big challenge. Now you can detect that it's a mixture by the optical activity. If they're equal amounts, this will actually show no optical activity to be what's called a racemic mixture. But if, if you have some R and some S and you want to separate them, then you have to put them through something that's chiral. And so you might put them through a bacteria where one of these gets digested and the other one gets excreted, and that would help you separate them. The other thing you can do is you can add on another stereocenter by doing a chemical reaction and end up with diastereomers because these have different chemical and physical properties. So the different arrangements in space and not being mere images of each other allow these to have different boiling points, uh, melting points, and chemical reactivity. So you could convert an enantiomer into a diastereomer, separate the diastereomers, and then reconvert it back to the enantiomer, and that would allow you to separate your mixture. 
The other thing that's important is how do you change these? So if I have butane and I want to make methylpropane, what do I have to do? And so for structural isomers, you have to break the bonds and then reform new bonds. There's no way to convert them without actual bond breaking. But conformational isomers, you can do simply by rotating. And so here we can get into the fact that you know infrared light might spur rotation, and then we'll end up with a conformational isomer. And that can be useful in spectroscopy, where we could do infrared spectroscopy to detect what type of molecule we have. In enantiomer, you actually do need to break bonds in order to convert from R to S or something along those lines and then reform a new bond. And then diastereomers, you also would need to break bonds in order to reform, although in the case of alkenes, you could break the pi bond, which is still breaking a bond, do a rotation, and then reform the pi bond, which might be a little simpler. So here I have a built a molecule, I have a methyl group here, I've got a halogen and a, a hydroxyl group here. And, and so what I've constructed here is I've constructed basically a, a chiral carbon center, a stereo center right here. Uh, this thing right here is going to be optically active. And I've set up the case where there would be an enantiomer of this that I can construct by switching the places of two of the constituents. Okay, so the first question I have is, is this R or is this S for this particular chiral stereo center? And so to do that, I'm looking at a carbon attached here, an oxygen attached here, a hydrogen here, and then some kind of halogen. Now, whatever the halogen is, it's going to be the number one priority. Then the oxygen is going to be the number two priority, the number three, and the number four priority. So in order for me to see whether this is uh, optically active, or I'm sorry, R or S, what I need to do is I need to orient myself where I'm looking down at the carbon with the fourth hydrogen, with the fourth constituent as far away from me as possible. And then I want to look and see how this rotates. So just by looking at it like this, it looks like I'm going from top to the bottom left to, to kind of, um, to the, to the, not to the left, I'm looking at the top to the bottom right, to the bottom left. And so I'm looking at a clockwise rotation. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna reorient this so we can see that really nicely. So, so what I wanna do is I wanna take this, and you can see this, this hydrogen here is now as far away from me as possible. Okay, and so now I have the number one priority, number two, and the number three. And so if you can look at how that would rotate, let me freeze that. So the hydrogen, the number four priority is now far away and I'm looking at it where the carbon is, is directly in front of that. Well now if I reassign I've got one, two, and three, and that's very clearly a clockwise rotation and therefore that would be R as we predicted. Okay. Now if I were to flip-flop, two of the different ends on this. If I kind of take this apart really quickly, I'm going to switch the green and the black. It doesn't matter which two I switch, any two. Okay, and I'm going to reorient it. So again, there's my hydrogen sticking out back here. So I'm going to set this right there. All right, so by, after switching two, if I read number, I've got one, I've got two, I've got three. Now I'm going in the counterclockwise direction, and therefore I now have the enantiomer. Now, this would be optically active. The R would be optically active. If I had equal amounts of both, that would give me a racemic mixture, and that would not be optically active. Um, and then these are configurational isomers. And they have different, I'm sorry, they have the same physical and chemical properties, so these would both react the same. However, the physical property is different in how they interact with polarized light, and these potentially could interact with a different chiral molecule differently. Okay?